with any capital improvement project would be going to the that project cost that was in the budget. I'm not sure what the overhead would be, but could you explain that a little bit more? Okay. Now you have a, a uh, inspector that goes out and checks on this. Oh uh, yes. How is his time but, uh, accounted for? Does it go to the contract oh. or is that just overhead? Okay, thank you very much for explaining that. Um, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so when we, um, well, when we do a large project that's our own, that we're paying the contractor for, the inspector's time is, uh, I mean, he just gets paid to be on our projects. Um, it's not being charged to the contractor. It's, um, it's just part of what his salary is based on doing. Um, if there's a large project that's being done by a private um, developer, we charge that developer a fee for a construction permit based on the magnitude of that project. And those fees are, are basically what compensates for the, the time that is spent uh, with either our inspector or our public works people responding and um, assisting with that project. Good. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just trying to find out how we account for people's time when they're doing what looks like the same job, but kind of in a, under a different umbrella, if you would. Yeah, on the on the private development versus the public, yes. our own. Yes, yes. So we do we do have a method to capture some of those costs from the developer. And again, it's based really on the magnitude of that project. So on the the estimated cost that the developer is going to spend on a project, we have a percentage that we charge them just to get their permit to do the work. And that fee compensates for the time that the staff has to spend, whether it's the inspector or public works doing um, uh, operating water valves or, or taking uh, bacterial samples and things like that, um, that fee compensates for, for those services. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I can, I can expand on that question. I think it's, it's fairly, a, it's a, that's a, a big question. That's, uh, I would answer that question as it, it depends. You know, some projects that are you know, grant funded, a lot of times there's a local match requirement to it, and, and we build that as an in kind, so those costs are included in the project as part of the grant. Uh, other projects we have a you know, indirect cost allocation that we negotiate to capture some of the costs from the grant. So sometimes it's internal, sometimes it's, sometimes it's in the grant, sometimes it's outside of the grant, but we're uh, it really depends on the project and you know the amount of funding, the likelihood of securing the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little different tact than what Steve's talking about with the construction projects. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, John. That's a, that's a good um, good addition to to those fees. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, jump right in. So the first fund I'm just gonna go through is the street system development charges. You can find that on page 58. Um, as you may remember from the previous year in our funds, when we approve a budget for especially our system development charges, we are approving an expenditure authority for all of the funds available. Uh, we don't ever anticipate to fully expense all of the funds. However, we wanna make sure that they are at least appropriated. That way, when projects do come up throughout the year that we are able to use system development charge funds, uh, we wanna make sure that those funds are available uh, to use. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that our charges for services, which are basically a portion, uh, the streets portion of the system development charges, uh, and then the fund balance available that is there. Over on the expense side, um, I kind of just pick a number at random as far as what 
I, what we're going to expend in materials and services and what we're going to appropriate for capital outlay. Um, those can change throughout the year, but normally we haven't had any projects in the last few years that go over those amounts. Um, but I make sure to appropriate at least all of the funds so they are available to use. It is quite a bit higher, especially if you go back and look at the 2017-18 number and then you look at what we're, so that's yep. just, just in case money, that's not any plan? So um, Sue might be able to discuss a couple of the projects that we may have on our capital improvement plan that may use a portion of these SDC funds that are available. Um, we definitely do not have projects outlined and ready to go that will exhaust any of these funds. No. Um, however, they will likely use a couple hundred thousand, maybe a couple hundred thousand or so um, for specific projects. Sue, did you want to mention a couple of those specific projects that are going to use some of the SDC funds? Yes, absolutely. So the primary project would be the North Vernonia Road um, sidewalk project. The ha half of that funding is eligible for SDC fund use. And another project that we will be starting um, hopefully next spring is the Columbia Boulevard sidewalk project, which will build a sidewalk on one side of the road connecting Gable to Sykes and then doing some improvements at the Columbia Boulevard and Sykes Road intersection for pedestrian passage. Um, also installing a flashing beacon crossing light in front of McBride Elementary School. Um, that is actually a grant project, but our matching funding for that will be SDC funds. Okay. And I believe the matching funds for that are about $60,000. Th those are the Sue, two any, primary projects. Sue? Yes. Uh, Doug Morton, uh -huh. any of the, uh, any of those, any funds allocated for the Strand Street project uh, for either planning or uh, any, any, any other kinds of uh, uh, issues with that? Yeah, that's a really good question because it certainly seems like it would be eligible. However, um, those are not, uh, actually they have not been dedicated uh, right-of-way yet and the projects that SDC funds can be used for first of all have to be for an existing right-of-way um, and that has to be a project that's been identified in the SDC um, funding um, the, the, what do I want to say, um, how they determine what our SDCs are going to be. There's a specific sure project is. list and that's usually comes from, in this case it's streets, so usually would come from the transportation system plan, but um, other, other um, input can be used to develop that list. And only projects that are identified by that particular, in that particular study that determines what our SDC rates are going to be, can be used um, SDC funds to, to um, construct or improve. And those projects are, they don't, they don't uh, technically exist. So they're not in the SDC project list. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. And if you haven't noticed on the bottom, I put the page number of the capital improvement list. It's actually page 72 um, and it goes on for a few pages, but on page 73, there is a summary list of the five-year capital improvement plan. And you can see all of the major street projects that are listed. And on the far right, I put in their funding source, which you'll see the safe routes to school columbia boulevard that was just discussed you'll see it says streets sdc you'll see a couple other projects like sue was talking about the north of Vernonia. um it's 50 percent uh stp funds which are, are state funds from the grant from the state mm -hmm. and 50 percent sdc so you can uh, kind of peruse that project list as we go through all of the system development charges funds just to see what projects that uh, we have that we can use some of these funds for. 
I'm and hearing you, you say there's a pretty big contingency left in here though. Yes, usually every year we roll over almost all of, all of it. Um, this upcoming year is when we are actually really starting to actually use it. Okay. okay. Any other questions on the streets SDC? So we'll move to the next system development charge fund, which is the water. So same idea here, we appropriate to spend everything, um, even though we likely won't spend all of the $915,000 that we have, um, we make sure and appropriate those funds so they are available. So the charges for services, again, is the system development charges that we re receive throughout the year from different developments. Uh, the beginning fund balance is the fund balance available. Any questions specifically on the water SDC? Uh, on these new developments, in other words, we're putting in a brand new street and putting in new pipes. Is this where the money basically comes from? Or is that uh, budgeted from the street and the new development? Did you want me to answer that, Matt? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So the, the fees are paid when the lots are actually developed. Um, like in a new subdivision, all of the infrastructure is paid for by the developer. But when that infrastructure starts to get used, it creates additional impacts on our system, whether that's the water system, the street system, sewer, storm drain, parks. Um, anytime there's a new use, it creates a new impact on, our, on one of our systems or all of our systems. So that's the calculated fee that is a system development charge that is charged to each, each uh, either whether it's a single family residential home that's being built or a large commercial development. Um, those fees are charged when it's actually developed and there's an intended use. But they don't pay a fee when they're just installing the infrastructure because it's not actually being used yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll jump ahead to the sewer system development charges. That is gonna be on the next page, page 50. Same idea here. We appropriate all the funds to be used. I don't anticipate uh, Sue being able to spend 1.5 million in sewer system development charges. Um, well, she probably could spend it. Um, uh, but... <laughs> oh no. So, pump station, I could on a pump station. <laughs> on uh, page 51, you see the storm SDCs. Um, same idea here as the other funds. We appropriate to spend everything, um, although we don't anticipate um, fully expending all of those funds. Are there any questions specifically for the sewer or storm SDC that either Sue or myself can answer? I have a question. Um, why do we allocate all the funds? So if they are not allocated, what you would see instead of materials and services and capital outlay, you would see unappropriated fund balances. And through the Oregon state budget law, once we approve a budget with an amount for unappropriated fund balance. So let's say in the storm SDC, I put 180 in materials and services, and then instead of putting it in capital outlay, I create, I create the line item for unappropriated fund balance, and I put $180,000 in there. Then throughout the year, something happens, some project comes up that, hey, oh, we can build this, uh, this storm drain and something. Um, and it may be SDC eligible, and let's say it costs $250,000 to do. Um, legally, I can only spend $180,000 uh, because the remainder of those funds are sitting in an unappropriated account. And unless there is a state emergency, um, I cannot use those funds for anything if they are sitting in unappropriated. So we make sure to at least appropriate those funds in some kind of category just to ensure that they are available if and when a project does come up. Mm -hmm. Okay, just making sure because sometimes people are like, well, why don't you move the exact amount that you need? But this <laughs> far out, you don't know the exact amount. And I just wanted that on the record that it's not our choice, that that's kind of the way it works. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And, and go ahead, sir. Oh, sometimes we have an opportunity for a grant 
And if it's a grant for a project that is SDC eligible, then we are able to um, apply for those grants, allowing the SDCs to be our matching funds. Um, so uh, that's happened a few times. Or, or a developer will come along and we want a, a pipe bigger than they're required to install. We that's, could make that very efficient choice of yes. participating in that upgrade. As, yes. You know, that's, that's another perfect example. And that is, we have had that happen before. Uh, a, a developer builds a road, uh, they only need a local street, but our master plan says that they need to have a uh, collector street, which is more asphalt, it's wider, bigger sidewalks, the whole works. so there's extra costs involved in that. Um, as long as it was a project that was identified in that SDC, calculation, then we can pay out of the SDC funds, we can pay for building the street to a higher standard that the developer required. Super. I have a question about kind of all of them in, in general. So when you're looking at the resources, um, of course, these resources come from when people build and then they pay these fees, right? That's so. Right. So we're kind of making a guess about what's going to happen in the next year right now. And I see that the guess is that growth has happened more so than over last year. Um, do you think that that is an accurate estimate being that we'll do more um, this coming year than last year, considering we're kind of missing a few months of this year? Uh, in short, I'm going to answer Yes, we're seeing a lot more development than we have in the previous year. Um, Sue can maybe mention that, and, and I see that Jacob, our city planner, is also online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna give him the opportunity to become unmuted and speak if he wants to as well. Sue, did you wanna start talk first about some of the future developments? Yeah, so there's a couple of subdivisions that have just recently finished um, and aren't built out yet. So we, and we are still seeing building permits coming through for that uh, so we anticipate we anticipate building going on for that in addition we also have a large apartment complex that was approved and they're um, getting ready to uh, start turning in per permits and getting that uh, that project rolling along um, another, Jacob may mention it, but he happened to mention earlier today that another subdivision was um, indicating that they're going to be submitting for um, their planning permit. So there's definitely still development going on. Um, we, I, I, would, I would say that we would be seeing a, a year similar to this in the, in the next budget cycle as far as permitting and, and um, fees being paid through this. You don't think you're going to see a bare spot for a couple months at some point in this? Well, well there's always that chance, um, but we haven't seen any indication of that. Okay. Even, even with this current situation, uh, they, we're still seeing the same activities. Um, and I, I would think Jacob would have some more input along those lines. Uh, yeah, so it, it's, been, it's been really interesting and we kind of want Yeah. Oh. It's, been a, it's been a fascinating, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm out weeding my strawberry garden. I kind of like this setup. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's surprising how all the big stuff hasn't slowed down. They're still submitting for building permits, land use permits, all, all the big stuff is going. The, the only uh, possible noticeable slowdown are the um, you know individual residential owners and their projects. And you know we still get some you know shed auxiliary dwelling unit questions, um, but those are a little down. But all the big stuff, all the big stuff's pedaled in the metal, just like it was without the pandemic. Awesome. That's great news. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky in the fact that Oregon did not um, did not deem construction as non-essential. Yeah. So they shut down construction and Oregon let them keep building as long as they could keep people safe. So. Well, and it's also nice that people are they're discovering that St. Helens is a nice place. A nice place. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, we're we fortunate the, that those people are still working. Why not St. Helens, right, 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 Rick? You got it, Jacob. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Le Leah, on the quarterly financial report that I j just gave to the city council, um, at the very last page of that is a record that I keep, um, that I used to keep when I was at Forest Grove was single family resident permits and how many of those are getting issued per quarter, um, just to give them a general idea of where the building department is. And so this last quarterly report was through March and we already even just through, through March have hit a five-year high for single family residence permits issued. Um, so even, even not with the remaining three months of the year, of the fiscal year, um, we're still well above where we've been in the last five years. Right, right, that's good. Just, I mean, obviously it wasn't really happening yet in March, but to have it at least start out high, if we have a little dip, you think we'll, Yep. That's good. I got to remember that. I, I keep telling myself you were the only person non-essential, but sometimes I forget other people get to go to work still. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to jump to the last system development charge, which is parks. Um, once again, same uh, philosophy here where we appropriate all the funds to be used. Um, this is one fund that uh, will definitely be used. Um, I don't know if Sue, if you want to mention about some of McCormick Parks, and um, I don't know if you want to talk about the potential money coming in with more developments um, and what that may mean for system development charges for parks. Um, well, one particular development, so I was uh, forwarded a draft version of the SDC fees, their calculations, for the um, new apartments that are proposed over on the large property behind the old transfer station by Wilcox and Flagle and the Starbucks across from Walmart, basically, mm -hmm. back in there. And um, the parks fee alone for that particular development is um, $345,000. That's just for parks for SDC fees. And that would be um, paid, they, they would have the option of making payments on that. And I don't know if that's something that they've talked to Matt at all about. Uh, but, you know, they also have a street fee, water fees, um, you know, the whole, whole nine yards. Um, their, their initial calculation was about $700,000 in SDC fees in total for that development. And th there was some pretty glaring errors on that. Their street fee was, I think, too high. I don't know where they got their numbers from. And they didn't include a storm drain fee at all. So I, I expect that it'll probably still come in around that same amount, but they need to make some corrections. No, we currently got a grant for Campbell Park. Is that, that'll come yes. out, part of that will come out of this? Is that correct? That would not be out of SDC fees. Okay. Um, the improvements that are there are coming out. Uh, the, the city's match for the grant will be coming out of um, just in-kind labor work. And then uh, the, the capital improvement park fee that was provided. We also have some storm drain work that'll be going through there. Uh -huh. So it, there's kind of a hodgepodge of different fund funding sources that will be the city's match for that project. So it'll take out the swell between the uh, tennis court and the parking lot? Yes, okay. yes, exactly. And then, and then we currently are applying for two grants. Is that going to be for 500000 each for parks? Is that, are those going to be SDC eligible? Um, I can't answer that because I'm not I'm not involved with that grant process. Okay. The two parks that are technically SDC eligible as of right now in our parks master plan mm -hmm. is mainly McCormick Park um, and possibly Columbia View Park if it gets officially expanded. Yeah. Um, it's very close on the borderline um, of meeting 
the requirements for the type of park it is. Um, and to be SDC eligible, we have to be over that threshold um, of a size for parks for acreage. Um, and so once we finalize that expansion of Columbia View Park, if that goes through, then SDC funds are will be available for Columbia View Park as well as McCormick. Well, once a physical distancing scene is lifted, we can expand that park through community members and make <laughs> it happen. More to come, for sure. Yeah. Um, any other last questions on system development charges? Uh, let me get this kind of straight. We have money, good. A and if you put it in this account, we can use it in one way without certain restraints. We put it in the other one, then you've got legal problems. Is that basically why we have an SDC fund? Yes, yeah, so system development charges are meant to, um, I, there's a few, <laughs> there's a couple different answers to your questions. Um, Sue, do you want to touch on basically? I, I the first one is, is they're specific. They are specific. Yes. Very specific. Yes, they very specific. Not go anywhere other than a portion to parks, a portion to sewer, a portion to streets. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's very important that we keep updated master plans like we did with the parks master plan, as well as what Sue, Sue is going, going to start going through with updating our storm and sewer and then water after that. Um, but system development charters are very heavily restricted on what you can spend and what you can't spend on it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are uh, legal issues if you do spend money on something you're not supposed to with those funds. So we're, we're very careful in what we can spend and we have a very specific list on what options we have and what projects we can do with these funds. Yeah, I would, more generally, I would say it's, a, it's a, a concept where development is paying its way and not spreading its, its burdens over upon the community. It's a way to capture the fees of upgrading the pipes and providing the parks facilities and the stormwater upgrades and right. things of that nature. Yeah, but there's, it, it, it's, it turns into math and, and law real quickly, so. Councilor Topaz, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, it's basically the legal gamesmanship of how we use our money. Yes. We have <laughs> so much money that we can use but if it's in an SDC fund, you can only use it for this particular Correct. things. Yep, exactly. A yep. Okay, and uh, as compared to, say, a large unrestrained general fund. Correct. Yeah, there's there's nexus and there's proportionality and there's all these factors that it has to be a, a part of an um, adopted plan. There's a lot of things that go into it. So. It has to be to expand mm -hmm. that, right? Like it's not like we can just take it and use it even for something new, it has to be expanding the system that it's in, correct? It has to increase the capacity of the system. Yes. Right. So you can't just take it and go, well, it's it's roads or it's this, let's put in a streets, it's put in sidewalks. It has to actually you can't just use it in that way either. We can't replace a four inch line with another four inch line. Right. Yes. And, and even like some of the water projects that we're doing right now, where we're replacing four inch lines with six inch lines, those don't qualify because they should have been six inch lines to begin with. So they don't qualify for SDCs. They weren't in the, the master plan list of SDC projects, eligible projects, because they're just meeting capacity. They're not expanding capacity. Okay, All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. So you can go ahead and flip to page 66. This is our major equipment fund. So we're going to start going through our internal service funds. So these are all funds that are mainly um, funded through internal charges from multiple departments. So the, the equipment fund is um, 
mainly now a public works equipment fund um, for them to save money over time for vehicles and purchases. Um, I've put their anticipated purchases for this next year on the bottom of this page. Their five-year projection is listed in the capital and improvement plan as well. So you can see, um, at, at least on paper, as of this moment today, um, what Sue plans on purchasing over the next few years um, through this equipment fund. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I do want to mention, um, you'll see kind of a new line item in there for miscellaneous general at $200,000. Um, and if you look at the actual budget, you'll see enterprise lease management for $200,000. Um, that is part of the new lease program that the city leases all of their police vehicles through, as well as several uh, city hall vehicles now. So um, that management program, um, I've gone ahead and put in here. So those charges come from the police department and all the other uh, departments that do have leased vehicles through that program. and. I think that pretty much covers some of the bigger, um, that, that biggest change in this fund. So um, Sue, did you wanna talk about anything in the equipment fund for this next year? No, it's a pretty small list this year. Um, the, it's mainly for um, parks. Uh, they need to replace one of their older mowers. It's about 22 years old. Um, Keith, that might have been the one that you used to use. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, so they're they're wanting to replace that mower. Um, then they also want to add a lean-to on the back of their equipment shed so that they can store some other implements out of the weather. So they will tend to last a little bit longer. And then the wastewater treatment plant is looking to replace one of their pumps at the pump station number seven, which is down off of Old Portland Road down towards Letica. I, I have a question. Let's uh, all of a sudden need another device. Let's say another pump to spray disinfectant. How is that handled in this uh, the fact that it's not on the list. So a, a large expense that isn't on the list. Um, so you'll see in this particular fund and, and likes the system development charge funds, um, I will usually appropriate all of the funds available. So you'll see a contingency amount in this fund of the $503,500. Um, that would be available to transfer through a budget adjustment process up to capital outlay or materials and services to purchase a piece of equipment uh, that may be needing to be replaced sooner rather than, than later. So this was a new piece of equipment nobody had ever thought of. You can still do the same again though. Yes, you can. I, I was worried about if you made a list, you couldn't exceed the list. Are we talking about the GPS lawnmower? That's correct, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So, so unlike system development charges, internal service funds um, do not have as many restrictions on them. So uh, we're able to create a list and if something changes or something breaks, who can make that decision uh, through John and the council um, mm -hmm. to purchase any kind of additional equipment that may be needed. Yeah. Hey, Mayor, that's a good project for you. Come up with a Roomba lawnmower. Yeah, GPS. I think they have those. Yesterday. Do they? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> They're pretty expensive still though. Uh, okay. Any other questions for the equipment fund? Hey Matt, just uh, it, in, I'm just curious, do we drive our, our city hall vehicles enough to be leasing them? We had that place to give back a vehicle that has not very many miles on it. Yeah, actually, uh, we just literally had that discussion uh, a few weeks ago with uh, Sue and Jacob, John, um, and everybody about the Ford Fusion that we leased. Yeah. Um, so we've had that car for almost a year now. And um, I went out to drive it um, a few months back, and it wouldn't start. And so I called uh, AAA, we had them come out, found out that the battery had died. Um, and this car has 650 miles on it. Oh my gosh. 
Yeah. Uh, so we took it up to the Ford dealership. They <clears throat> fixed it, um, came back, it drove fine. I went back out literally probably a, two weeks later uh -huh. and it had died again. <laughs> and this is a car that had 700 miles on it now. Um, and so we're talking almost a brand new car with issues. And we started talking, John and I, about, you know, with a car that we've had almost a year and it's got 700 miles, the anticipated use for that vehicle was that city hall workers would be taking that to trainings that are in Portland or in Bend or, or anything like, like that. That was the anticipated use of that kind of a vehicle. And we just haven't seen that in the last couple of years. So actually we sent it back to Enterprise and they have it right now. They've, they're taking it to another dealership to get the battery, whatever the issue was actually fixed. And they're going to try and sell it through their market. Um, one of the great things about the lease program is that if a vehicle isn't working out for us, um, just because we use the word lease doesn't mean that we're stuck into a contract for four years or five years to lease this vehicle. If there's a change in the program or something that we need to do, like get rid of a vehicle, because sometimes you do get a lemon, um, then Enterprise can do whatever they need to do with the car and try and sell it through their network. Um, and then we can either use that to pay down another car or we can exchange cars and figure that out. So what we ended up doing was contacting Enterprise. They're trying to sell the vehicle. And instead of replacing that, what we are doing are, is replacing one of the cars we already have that is, I believe it's, it's the planner's vehicle. So it's Jacob's car. I think it's like one of the 1987 Blazers or something that we have, 1994. <laughs> it's not that old. It's, it's a 2000 and oh, okay. some odd, um, but it's, it's been problematic ever since we've had it. It's had electrical issues. Is that the one where the door fell off? No, that was one of the red ones. That was the red one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so Jacobs, we're re replacing the Fusion car with a new lease for Jacob and getting rid of the car that Jacob has. The white blazer. The white blazer. Yeah. So and we're getting another Ford Escape that is four-wheel drive, so it'll be available. And, and if we need to for the snow, rain, sleep, mud, all the stuff that they may get into. Um, but that's one of the beauties of that program is that we're really not tied down to a two-year lease or a four-year lease. Yeah. It, it, so, I mean, the 750 miles, I guess what I'm saying is even if we were to buy and we had an issue like that with a car that had 750 miles on it, it's still going to be under warranty for at least two years. And, and the dealership is gonna, if you have a lemon, they're gonna, they will work with you and, and just send it back to Ford or GM. So, yep. And that's, that's one of the benefits of the, the lease program with Enterprise is they're anticipating you only keeping the car for three, four years at most. Um, so three so, years at 750 miles though, uh, per year, that's what? Even if it's 1,000 a year, that's 3,000 miles on a car. Yeah. That's not worth let, paying that lease. Correct. Enterprise sell it. Correct. So that's my point. I understand the police vehicles, driven a lot, wear and tear, high speeds, low speeds, um, off-road sometimes. I get it. Yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. You yeah, guys are not a problem. So. Okay. So no more questions about the equipment fund. We'll go ahead and move on. The next fund is the IT services fund. So this is obviously where we have our IT specialist out of along with our contracted um, service provider for IT services, along with some additional equipment that we anticipate purchasing over this year and next. Um, how much that equipment is, um, is really up in the air right now. We've almost, uh, I wouldn't even say we've really got started 
that much on our IT infrastructure project. Um, we're right in the middle of finalizing a contract with a new service provider. Uh, once that contract is signed, they're gonna come in um, and start looking at things and writing down what needs to be replaced, what equipment we can still use, um, and getting more of a kind of a game plan um, in line. So uh, it's kind of an ongoing project right now. I've obviously, um, like I did with the system development charges and the other internal service funds charges, you'll see that I appropriate to use all of those funds. Um, I don't anticipate using the full $518,000. However, with IT, if you're familiar with anything related to IT, you know that it gets expensive real fast, real quick. So um, it's kind of up in the air right now. Now all of the funds, the revenue sources for the IT services are funded through departmental charges. So you will notice as we go through later on, when we get through the general fund and excuse me, into the other departments, you'll notice that a lot of the funds, a lot of departments have higher IT charges. Um, and that is because to charge a more real allocation method um, that I put into place, this that is shown in this budget, as well as those potential anticipated costs for replacing uh, a lot of the computers that are overdue, as well as some of the servers and equipments um, and moving to virtual where it's possible along with some other things going on. Well, if you look at leading cities that are leading in an IT and you look at a city our size, or maybe just a little bit larger that are leading in IT, we are way behind on our IT budget, period. Yeah, that's that's pretty apparent. Um, however, I don't think it's out of out of real choice. I, I, you know, I think my yeah, predecessor yeah. John Ellis, who was here, um, obviously was went through a lot with the city of St. Helens, especially in the recession days, um, and that was a point where the city really didn't spend a whole lot on upgrading IT, upgrading computers, um, because they were making choices between a computer or people. Uh, so. There were some tough choices over probably the last, before I got here, five years, and even in the last first couple years that I was here, um, just kind of looking at things and, you know, poking a few bears. Um, so we, we've seen those issues, and so what we've done with the IT specialist that we hired um, is uh, Darren has been able to help me kind of put a real replacement schedule together where we're accounting for all the computers on a five-year replacement schedule. Um, whereas some of our computers, um, you know, especially in the library where we're still running, um, I don't even want to say it, <laughs> uh, running old systems, let's say, uh, that we shouldn't be. So um, getting that process started has been a slow start um, for the last year or so, but we're finally getting to that starting point um, here in the next couple months. Matt, we have a lease program for equipment for the police department cars. Can, is there any lease systems for IT equipment? Well, you can always lease equipment as far as um, sonic walls and several other things. Um, you know, as far as computers and laptops and that kind of thing, um, there is not a lease program that at least publicly that I'm aware of. Yeah, that was the question was how much equipment could we lease you know, how far down the line? Yeah, and, and that that will be part of the questions for some of the equipment that we do look at replacing. Uh, do we purchase that equipment outright and own it, or do we lease it for three years, four years, and five years and um, redo the lease at the end of the term? Um, so those are choices and things that uh, myself, Darren, uh, and our new service provider uh, that ho should hopefully be coming online in the next month uh, will help us kind of delve into a little bit um, and we'll make sure to include the council in those decisions uh, to make sure that you understand where we're going and what the what the road we're taking is. Well part of the thought was 5G is starting to push around the world and what will our base equipment need to be modified to to be able to handle the 5G. Well, I can almost guarantee you, unfortunately, by the time we get something in, it'll be out of date um, as fast as some technology moves in the world. So um, as best as we try to stay on top of things, um, we put, I kind of put that trust in our IT specialist as well as more heavily in our service provider that we have to make sure that we have all the updated virus 
BIOSware, ransomware, uh, and equipment is up to date um, and doesn't have any patches that are three months or two years overdue and those kind of things. And those are some of the issues that have plagued us um, to date so far. Any other questions on IT services? I, I probably asked this last year, um, but I don't remember, so I apologize. Um, so I, I understand that we're hiring a group to come in and try to kind of help, so kind of a contractor separately, um, and that that's kind of the expense professional services there. But I also noticed that on regular wages from 2018 to 19 to the proposed now, it's quite a difference. Um, and I know it was last year, but I don't remember why. I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, the reason you see 1819 is only $22,000 is because when we hired the IT specialist, we hired them very late in the year. Um, so the actuals that you're seeing are, I believe it was right around April. Um, it, may have even been April 16th, um, that we originally hired our IT specialist. So that $22,000 is, is probably two or three months of salary and benefits um, for that time frame. And then you have the 131 that is their, was their first full year here. And then the 140 for this year's proposed, um, you'll see it's mainly just um, a little bit of regular wages increases um, because the per, our IT specialist that started starts at a step one, two, or three on a five-step schedule. So their step is, yeah. is included in that, as well as a um, kind of a flat percentage increase for uh, retirement and uh, insurance usually goes up a little bit as well. So that's part of why you see it jump up to 140. Matt, I have a question. Can you hear me? I had weird stuff going on with my computer, yeah. Yep. Um, in what can you tell me what com the line item computer maintenance is and how that differs from professional service? I just don't have a good grasp on what you know. I, I would assume that professional services is that contractor that you're talking of that will yep. come and do some of the work. How is that different than the line item for computer maintenance? Yeah, so the professional services is mainly all of that, um, what we call a service provider, the MSP, um, that we're going to go with. And we've had a company that has been with us in the past for 20 plus years um, that we're starting to move away from with a new company. Uh, the computer maintenance and everything is um, a, a plethora of little options. <laughs> um, and that includes things like Adobe Photoshop memberships. Um, memberships that our communications director uses, um, as well as all of the licensing that we have uh, for Office 365 for most of our employees that we're transitioning to, um, as well as any additional software that they may have um, that's included in that. So that computer maintenance is kind of all of those little small services um, and memberships that we have uh, throughout the city. Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to move on to public works operations. This is kind of the night of Sue. <laughs> so um, public works operations is mainly two departments. It's the engineering department and the public works operations. Um, and I I think if Sue, if you're okay, I'll kind of hand it off to you to talk about the Public Works Operations and Engineering Fund. Um, and so I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Matt said, where it's basically the two separate divisions of Public Works Engineering, which is uh, just the three people uh, based out of City Hall, and that's where our inspector is based out of, is out of the engineering department. Um, and all, you know, all of the all of the funding for this is allocated from the various uh, enterprise funds: um, sewer, water, storm drain, and the street fund. So a percentage of everybody's, um, all of the personnel services costs uh, comes out of those funds. Um, the operations is, that's where all the fun happens. Um, all the guys that are out on the streets working every day, um, down in those manholes, cleaning the sewers, 
fixing the storm drains, building building new storm drains, putting in uh, new water meters. That's our operations crew. Um, they're the ones that are based down there at the city shops and yeah, I don't know what else to say about the funding here. So probably one of the um, differences you may notice in the engineering department is the $75,000 that is listed in projects and programs. Uh, yeah. so do you want to mention for a couple of seconds just what that is? Yeah, if you didn't have a chance to read the, um, the questions and answers that Matt had sent out yesterday. So there's a, a the GIS system, which is used extensively, extensively by the engineering department, the planning department, public works department, um, even the police department, building department, we all use the GIS system. And the GIS system is created uh, with a few different sources. One of them is the tax maps that we get from the county. So that just lays out the basic lot lines but the, the rest of it is digitized information from aerial flights. And the last time we've had the entire city flown and digitized was in 1995. We had a small portion of the city re-digitized in 2001 because we had a lot of subdivisions built in that five or six year period. Um, obviously since 2001, we've had a lot more subdivisions and a lot of additional development and a lot of other changes, especially down on, along the waterfront that are not accurately reflected in the digitized information that we have now in our GIS system. We don't have any way to change that information other than getting new aerial flights and new digitized imagery. Um, again, this is something that's uh, not just used by public works, but planning uses it all the time, building uses it all the time, the police department uses it all the time. Um, it's obviously not an inexpensive undertaking, but we put 75% uh, of the expected cost, which is around $100,000 into the engineering um, projects and programs uh, budget this year. Um, because again, our funding is all allocated out of street, sewer, storm, water, um, all of those funds, which consist of all of these features that are uh, incorporated into the GIS system. Um, planning department is expected to pick up the other 25%, sorry, Jacob, of of this project, uh, but it really is something that the, all city departments utilize. Um, so it's it's an important thing, and it's very much out of date. And I'm going to unmute Jacob just so he can uh, speak. Yeah. So uh, Sue talked about the digitized information. Um, we do have a series of aerial photos from 2000 nine mm -hmm. and those aerial photos are just as valuable as the data that's created from them Correct. You can use that from anything from day to day oh citizen you want to try to understand where your property lines and the utilities are we can give them an aerial photo um it, which really helps with context because a lot of people don't understand property lines especially when the property lines are funky and then we use them for grants for everything and I still want to make the big, huge aerial photo for the council chambers, but the 2009 one's a little dated for that. I just wanted to put that little extra input in there. Thank you. Can any of this uh, be picked up from any of the satellite companies? Or is that where the flyover comes from? No, I believe the flyover is from actual airplanes. I, I don't believe that the satellite information and get the the um, the quality that we would need unless it was a government satellite of some sort that we probably would not be able to afford or be allowed to use and or be allowed to use yeah <laughs> uh, is any of this possible 
possibly done by the state that we could just borrow or does the state do this at all? They, not that I'm aware of, um, not for the type of information that we need. There are, there are various companies out there and we do, would go out and get bids for this, but it's not just the photography, but it's the digitizing of those, the little outlines of the houses, the outlines that say, where is a street? Where is a tree? Where is this sidewalk? Um, it goes so far as showing little symbols for manholes and things like that. Well, so, Jacob used them earlier, and he's able with this digital um, software to take the houses and take the trees off the land. Yes. To see where the earth is. Yeah, exactly. Almost like a video game. And there's no photograph that's ever going to be able to do that to show somebody precisely where something is. Because even going to the site is not going to take all the houses out of a neighborhood to right. see what it looks like. Yes. But the ability to turn houses on and off and put zone lines on things. Yes. And put property lines on things. Yeah. It really clears up confusion for property owners, developers, businesses, so they know exactly what they're committing to ahead of time. Yes. It's just, yeah. It's all easy for me to understand. Yeah. Just, just thought I'd throw something in here. The, these these photographs are adjusted. They're actually they've they've been adjusted to the curvature of the Earth so that you can actually measure distances from them. Yes. So they're they're not just ordinary aerial photos. They they're corrected photos. So yes. they're a wonderful tool. I mean, when I where I used to when I used to work for a living, we used them all the time, and it's and and it's an essential it's an essential tool for you to have. Yes, um, that's a very good point, um, Bill. Is that they the flights that they take are at um, various angles, and then they. They weave them all together, and and then that's how they make those corrections. Well, they also they also are they have control on the ground that they've used that they use to adjust these photos with as well. Exactly. Ooh. Any other questions for Sue or the Public Works Operations Funds that we can answer for you? Anybody? Yeah, Sue, so how many, um, when I'm looking at operations specifically, is that 21 full-time FTE captured in personal uh, services? No, it wouldn't be that many in the operations department. Um, we have 29 FTE altogether in public works, but that includes operations engineering we have the wastewater treatment plant we have the joint um, joint um, uh, mechanics yep yes the fleet people <laughs> <laughs> joint maintenance facility um, the parks department is actually included in that and then the water filtration facility so I believe there's um, 14 FTE in operations 13 or 14 Okay, so that's significantly different than I'm looking at our my book that Matt made for us on page 19. And I asked this question, I still haven't wrapped my mind around. Um, I'm not seeing parks FTE listed explicitly as a department on page 19. And I'm not <laughs> sure if that was just an oversight or if that's captured in one of these other categories is what I'm trying to um, wrap my head around. Is that so, recreation? Yeah. Parks is um, part of the, um, it well, they're, they're, it's under the public works umbrella, but it's actually part of the general fund. It, so it, is, is, it is actually listed in, so um, Claire, on the 21 that you're looking at in the, the 3.2 for engineering, the 21 for operations, uh, two for the water filtration facility, mm -hmm. two for the fleet, those are the mechanics, mm -hmm. um, and four for the wastewater treatment plant uh, on page 19. So the 21 does encompass all of the employees that are working out of water, sewer, streets, and storms that are split. Um, and that, and I can pull up. That would include the, the um, summer uh, FTE for summer helpers too, wouldn't it, Matt? Yeah, I'm going to quickly pull up um, a the sheet personnel. here. So that number that I'm seeing, 21 for operations, it encompasses many FTE 
in in addition to the operations um, FTE that's budgeted for on page 70. Well, everybody should be budgeted um, sure, from so on page 70. We have um, operations here that is really 16 FTEs. And then we have four and a half um, that are included. Now the seasonal part-time I put down as a 0.25 FTE. Um, you know, those are kind of give or take and a rough guess, um, but that's how I get to the 21. So the mechanics here are the two FTE, the water filtration facility, that's two. Um, the wastewater treatment plant, which is four full-time FTEs. Um, and you can see we have one FTE in the operations, that's the public works director job that is currently open right now, mm -hmm. as well as one utility worker um, that is unfilled right now. So you included the parks in so the, the park, operations? Yes, the parks okay. are included in the operations. And, okay. um, and Clara, on the final document that I do for the proposed budget, um, I will better break that out um, I think that's a good point to break those out to make sure that um, we are as clear as possible as we can with the FTE. So I will change that spreadsheet that you see on page 19 to break out parks. So Matt, I'm sorry that I have to go here, but so, um, and I know we're not talking about parks department yet, but yep. in parks department, we have some um, FTE. I assume maybe that's one full-time person that is not captured in the public works operations because public works operations are all of those individuals who kind of have split duties is that what i'm hearing so the people that are in parks the fte that are in parks on this page on page 19 are listed in the operations so let me go back to my spreadsheet here to show you So this is one of my big spreadsheets. Uh, you can see that right here we have the parks employees that are right now the three FTE um, that are in the upcoming budget year. So we have a park specialist, uh, parks utility one, and then the field supervisor right now. So those are the three main FTEs that are out of parks right now. So in yeah. one of the answers to my questions, what we did uh, with uh, Public Works and Sue was to go back and redo this huge allocation model that includes parks, it includes equipment, uh, water, sewer, storm, streets, and every FTE is split out uh, depending on what Sue and Dave uh, believe they proportionally work in. So you may have a utility worker that spends um, a lot of time in water and sewer, but not in storm and streets. So their salary and benefits are broken out dependent on where they spend their time. So what we did this year is we had Sue go back and, and really redo this spreadsheet that hasn't really been delved into, I think in the past, as much as it, we have kind of broken this out this year. Um, and so what we've done this year is I tried to get as much of a true cost allocation as we could. Um, and so you'll see, whereas in the past, we probably only did 40 or 50% of parks um, out of the general fund and then split those out between water, sewer, streets, and storms. Um, now we've got a true, a really better cost allocation model uh, where we believe 75% of all the parks employees are working in parks and um, another good percentage is where they're doing streets um, and helping maintain some of the right-of-ways and those kind of things. Um, so that 21 is a portion of the combination of this FTE, the full-time FTE, and our best guess for how many seasonal part-time people that are going to be hired. Okay, thank you, Matt. Nice having your computer right there, isn't it, Matt? Uh, this is why I stayed at work tonight. <laughs> if I had my laptop, I'd probably mute myself and be screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So if you, okay. if you did a little bit more of a breakdown this year as far as where all the workers kind of worked on public works, I don't suppose you separated out the like hours wise, how much of that goes to tourism? Mm. No, we have not broken that out really. Um, yeah. Sue, did you want to chat about the portion of that they helped with tourism? They help a lot with tourism. <laughs> um, we have tried to uh, track that in the past, and you know it, it takes uh, it takes time to document all that and keep track of all of it. Um, they they've certainly um, spent a considerable amount of time during certain times of the year, yeah. uh, but when they've presented that information, it's just been oh well, thank you very much. Um, it really hasn't. Uh, gone so far as to affect anything in the budget. I just always think in funding wise, I know we're really limited to what we can spend tourism dollars on, but I feel like that tourism dollars should be helping with that. Maybe. Um, so uh, uh, Leah, what, the, what we did put into the budget, um, and you'll see this, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the, Page here. Hang on one second. Um, so you'll see uh, if you go to page 42, I know we're kind of going to jump ahead just a little bit to look at the tourism department. Um, but you'll see it back in 2017 18, um, we did start doing a general fund support service charge. Um, which is where we tried to capture at least a little bit of those funds of what Public Works was using uh, when Public Works was helping out. So that we tried to recapture some of those funds initially. Um, it could probably um, realistically take almost another full-time person to track realistically how many hours and what work was done um, and then do that allocation back. So. The, the question for us as staff, I think, partly comes down to how much do you want to pay somebody to track this? The um, difficult thing about this, Leah, is that our public works is utilized. They're out doing city stuff first. Automatically, any any water breaks, any uh, sewer problems with sewer, they jump off of if they were working on Halloween Town specifically. Um, they jump off that and they go do those things immediately. They they will. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not voicing a complaint about the city workers doing it. No, All no. I'm trying to figure out is from a budget standpoint, like if somebody yeah. can make an estimate, how many hours are spent on 13 nights? How many hours are spent on Halloween Town? If we could get like a certain amount of hours that are being spent by public, that maybe we could get those funds and be able to get those out of tourism mm -hmm. as opposed to out of our general fund is, is the only point of the question actually. Mm -hmm. Could, by the way, could the uh, workers carry a time card <clears throat> on special projects uh, in their truck, uh, so put down hours for whatever, time. and at the end of the year take the time cards and it all up? They keep a log book in their trucks, so they, they log down the different tasks that they do on a daily basis. Um, but again, that has been tracked in the past, but it's even when the information has been provided, it's, it hasn't ever um, amounted to any, any changes. But if that is something that the, the council or the budget committee would like to, um, you know, track again, we would certainly start doing that again. That's a lot of nickel and dime time. And that the question is, where's the course benefit? Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would just uh, speak up on behalf of um, businesses around St. Helens. Um, uh, Leah, you're downtown. You know how packed it gets, uh, specifically downtown St. Helens. But not just limited to St. Helens. It's actually, if you were to go countywide, um, on events like Halloween Town, uh, Scapoose is very, very, very busy. They noticed an increase um, from our us bringing those tourists to right. Yes, yes. Which I guess that leads me to my point: 
as far as, so should the city of St. Helens be paying for all those hours through public works or should we be able to gather some of that from tourism? That kind of goes to my point about it. Um, as far as where the money comes from, you know, the city of St. Helens has a certain amount of money, maybe tourism, it's, it's just a different pot that sometimes it's hard to get into, it feels like to me. And it, so it seems like if we could come up with a good estimate on those hours, maybe we could get the money from there because it should be spread out further. And I, and I get what you're saying, but Councilor Topaz is, was what's, what, uh, what cost, you know, what, at what cost and well, trickle down economics and it does flow through our city, it, it employs people, it, um, businesses thrive, they make record businesses uh, record uh, revenues for the month of October and then some because um, we start a little bit earlier than October and it is employing a lot of people yeah we're not getting a lot more tax that's true but look at what it's doing to the economy inside it I'm not an economic person but I would imagine that somebody would say uh, the big the big ships in Newport they asked them to leave. It devastated their community. They didn't, want, they didn't want the big ships anymore. They made that festival go away because the highway was too packed. Yeah, not, not a complaint about anything that's happening, just trying to find more money. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I would skin. <laughs> just so you guys know that that truly did happen in Newport, that they, were, they couldn't get out on the highway, so the citizens' complaint made it went away. I, I guess I would, because for the majority of the year, it's like dust that they're doing. I mean, we're talking about crumbs. I mean, there's a few weeks that it is measurable, and it's like you feel like you're chasing your tail, and to the point is there's a percentage that is um, that we collect for admin that gets captured, and that goes into the general fund, and that's where parks money comes from. So there is, you know, there is money that comes back. I know that it doesn't seem like a direct offset where they're paying Joe Blow, you know, this many dollars put up the Christmas tree, which is a local thing we've done long before tourism. But I mean, whatever, money does come back to the general fund, which does pay for parks, which does pay for library, that does pay for police, which is, you know, about the shared, the shared burden and the shared benefit. So I, I'm not seeing that line. I know, uh, Matt, you said to look on page 43. If there's a percent for the admin. So it's going to be on page 42. Okay. Um, it's the last group. It's Department 725 Tourism. And in 1718 is when we last did that kind of charge uh, for the $12,581. Okay, that's that charge right there, but we haven't done it in a while. We haven't done it over the last few years for the right. reasons that Sue was talking about. Okay, oh, because of it not being tracked. But Sue, did you feel like $12,000, that's probably about the amount Public Works helped with those? It, I, honestly, it, it probably doesn't even touch that. No, <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I guess that that's was, my point. Once again, not to complain about all of the extra stuff, but just to find more money, you know? Yeah, uh, un unfortunately, the tur tourism does not have a lot of money to spend, um, which is why Public Works has to help out and do a lot of things. Yeah, and this year, more than ever, because of the yeah. COVID, they'll have even less. They'll have even less. Correct. Yeah. Which the events maybe won't be what they were either. Right, so. right. I mean, yeah. they'll, they'll be making do with a, a whole lot less this year. And I've already heard quite a bit of community outcry that they hope the whole year isn't canceled. And those are just local people that I see on the street every single day, not people coming in, people that visit here, that live here, lived here their whole life. That's part of the reason why they love living here. So, I mean, it's, yes, it is tourism, but it's also quality of life for our citizens, for sure. Because a lot of people really enjoy, you know, whether it's the, Scarecrows on the street or 13 nights or, you know, Halloween, you know, whatever, Kiwanis Parade, whatever it is that we do in our community, that's why people choose to live here. There is a one point about, quote, collecting money from tourism. A number of people are upset that tourism isn't paying their way. And they have really no great idea of what their way is and what's happening. But the fact they don't see uh, that tourism is paying something for our public workers 
uh, irritates them. So now I'm, it's kind of a political football type game as compared to a total numbers game. And that's well, I, I think there's probably um, property owners that um, have all of their properties rented that probably are very appreciative for tourism paying their way that way. And I'll just say this, that, that even when we were taking up a little bit, tourism's always been political. And yeah. there's four different directors there. Yeah, I know. And, and that, that's one of the things, how to smooth that out is really the question. Uh, uh, right. yeah, yeah, literally four different people. So, you know, number four. I don't want to, um, you know, dissuade some of the conversation, but we are kind of getting a little bit off topic from the budget at hand. Um, and it is 828, so... If, it's getting dark outside. I'm getting yeah, like I, can say, I can tell from your uh, video. You the <laughs> I can hear the frogs. Um, yeah, I, you can. <laughs> are there are there any other specific questions about the public works operations fund? All right, I'm well, gonna... uh, Matt. Yeah, I don't know what has helped me in the past, and I have not seen that document. And maybe that's not meaningful to other people. Is when they had FTE by department for the last few years. So that is kind of what um, Claire was talking about on page 19. Um, I do go back to 2012, 2013. I don't um, have a packet, so oh, I okay. don't have your agenda. So I don't have okay. um, You can view it online if you have the option to get onto the city's website and download the, the proposed budget there. Um, and I, there should be a hard copy in your box that I put in there. Okay, uh, I will. If you don't, I, will I can always, I can always give it. you another one. I've got, I've got a few extra ones. Um, that uh, weren't picked up by a few people that I thought were going to come pick one up. So, um, so I can put that in a document was super valuable for me to look at the overall trend rather than just last year, this year. Yep. Yeah. So the page 19 goes back to at least 2012, 2013. Um, that's when the information is at least easily um, readable and able to identify uh, for me. Um, back before that, it gets into previous budget people before even John Ellis and it's a little more Thank washy. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move forward to the major maintenance fund. Um, there's not too much to talk about. Like the other internal service funds, I appropriate all the funds to be spent. Um, the $250,000 um, is uh, the, the estimate that I have of the remaining funds from the $500,000 that was done a couple years ago for park investments. Um, depending on where Sue lands at the end of this fiscal year, um, that amount will change uh, depending on how much of those funds are expended this year. The library also has $173,000 available uh, to spend in, um, in this document. That number may be adjusted um, throughout the year as Margaret starts to do some of the projects um, at the library um, and that building that she's uh, talked to the council about earlier. And then we have a city hall project that is the facade improvements on the utility building and court building. Um, that is still a project to be determined that's going through the planning commission um, right now with uh, myself and Jacob are working with the planning commission to come with a finalized plan of materials and what it's going to look like and everything. Um, so that is a best guess um, of what the anticipated costs are. Um, so that may change depending on what the planning commission recommends and what the city council uh, wants to spend on that facade improvement. And then uh, we've kind of earmarked another $20,000 to finish up the police station study. Um, we got started on that. It's been kind of a lengthy progress uh, process uh, that we anticipate going into the next fiscal year. Um, but we should, we should be able to finish that project um, in 2020. Um, and be able to have a police station plan um, with funding options available to um, move forward on that project. Are there any questions about the major maintenance fund? So we're gonna jump over to community development fund, which is on, starts on page 40, is the main summary page. Uh, so this community development fund um, is mainly managed through Jenny uh, Dimsho and John Walsh on some of the developments and Rachel Berry has been helping with those projects. Um, so we have departments set up specifically for general economic planning, 
at the city of St. Helens, we have a department specifically set up for the industrial business park, which is the old Boise white paper site. We have a specific department set up for the riverfront district or uh, riverfront property. Um, and then a specific department for forestry. And then we are uh, proposing in this budget to move the tourism uh, fund into a department as into the community development fund. Um, so, you know, the question was raised uh, earlier today uh, from Mr. Lyons about uh, some of the coronavirus impacts on our budget. Um, and this is one area where you'll see a little bit of that decrease. On the top of page 40, you'll see taxes uh, for revenue, and those are the motel, hotel, or transient yeah, taxes. Uh, we're estimating those a little bit lower than what was adopted this current year. Uh, just based on the coronavirus, um, obviously taking an impact on tourism events. Um, and so you see a little bit of an impact there. Most of everything is pretty standard. We have some grant funds that we're anticipating um, this next couple, over this next year to help with some of the industrial park, the business park and the planning for that, the master plan for that park area. Um, so that's part of that $110,000 in revenue. Um, John, did you want to chat at all about the Community Development Fund or any current projects that you see in the upcoming year? Um, I... Yeah, there's just a lot going on in the fund right there. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot of our biggest projects are there's many grants in there. There's some funding sources. You look at the, the Cascades lease payments and you, you see a $300,000 revenue coming in there but on the expense side there's a uh, money going out to pay off both the note for the purchase of the property um, there's some borrowing there's some you know, several grants so the yeah you'll see two debt services listed there one is the boise three million dollar note that is the purchase of the boise white paper site that the city did um, so any money that we receive from that property, 50% of that goes toward goes to Boise. Um, so the Cascade lease payment, half of that goes towards um, that note, as well as any other money that we make off of that property through any other transactions. 50% um, will go to Boise until the note is paid off completely. Uh, and then the veneer property, which is the riverfront property, uh, that is just a million dollar note that we are um, continuing to pay down um, and we'll have that for a few more years until that's paid off. So we just kept timber low on that, that list there because we've already talked yeah, about so, it. Okay. Yeah, so Mayor, we did not, um, at least when we put this budget together, we did not anticipate doing any cuts this year. Um, you now, so what you're seeing in there with the $65,000, that is mainly just the management fees that we pay every year for the management of the timber harvest um, or that, that timber area. So if we were to decide, if you were to decide as a council to do a cut three months from now or something, that would just be recorded as additional revenue in the fund. Okay, I just, this was curious. Yep, yeah, but we did not put, because we weren't 100% sure we were gonna do any cuts, uh, we didn't put it into the budget um, so that we're not- you were working on this some time ago, but we, you know, we're, currently in the process of just waiting for timber prices to see what they're doing. So. Correct, yeah. So at any time, you can always make that change and decide to make um, as many, you know, one or as many cuts as you want. Yep. Yeah, it was a, a, a conser being conservative strategy to not show revenue there. Oh, I get it. Yep. yep. Any other questions about the Community Development Fund? Matt, what are the professional services listed? Um, well, in in each of these departments, economic planning, uh, the business park, seventy five thousand dollars of professional services, and yep. riverfront. I'm familiar with forestry and tourism. Yeah, so uh, it kind of depends on which department you want to pick. Um, professional services, specifically in the industrial business park, that is for some of the master plan work that we're having done. Um, that's just getting started this year and going into next year. Uh, part of those funds is part of that grant funds that we're getting from the state. So, um, you know, thankfully that's going to be partly paid for with grant funds. Um, on the economic development department, you see professional services at about $75,000. We tried to be a little conservative um, and 
and really break these departments out a lot better than they have been in the past. Um, because a lot of these projects are kind of come up, not surprisingly, but on short notice. Um, so in the past, a lot of the professional services have just kind of been dumped into economic planning in general. Um, so by creating mul these multiple departments, we're really trying to break out those expenses to be kind of as, as clear as we can as far as where expenses are going. Um, so that $75,000 is what we estimate for just for some general economic planning uh, projects that we have going. And then the same thing for the riverfront property, that's part of that master plan process for the riverfront, what it's gonna look like, where the streets are gonna go, sewer lines, all that fun stuff. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt, I've got a question on the business park. That, that uh, it, in your book, it says 198,000 versus the well, that's on page 40. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's on page 41. Oh, okay. okay. Are, you, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, Matt, going back to some of the planning activities that you're talking about, um, what, uh, I guess, what's my question? It's kind of a general question around what the city's current commitment is around those planning activities um, you know, what stage in the planning process are we? How much longer should citizens expect to spend, you know, a significant amount of money on planning activities? Um, as we look back, you know, in 1920, we had a significant amount at least um, adopted or allocated to those activities. Um, yeah, what's the plan? John, do you want to talk about some of the current plans yeah, we've got going on? It's a circus with a lot of rings there there's uh, <laughs> many projects going on and i'm not you know what level of detail we want to go into but uh, not a lot of detail yeah i mean you've got you know the, the veneer property with all the, you know, the several grants and the boardwalk planning and street design and utility ty types of work on the, the white paper you know we're looking, currently looking at a parcelization and similar serving water sewer Stormwater systems. There's also a, a plan working to create some building pads there, let me level off some of the, the rocky areas that are already pre disturbed. And there's also some grading and drainage planning. There's a whole stormwater, um, you know, for the mill, mill site thing we, have, we need to maintain uh, some permitting. And uh -uh. the timber, the yeah, there's just there's a lot of projects going yeah. on. <laughs> so I I think the uh, the answer to your question, Claire, is we're not 100 percent sure when you're going to see building. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not. I wasn't even thinking specifically building, but I mean thinking about those first three funds: economic planning, business park, and riverfront. I mean, I think my question was more around how many years would community members see major expenditures in planning of those areas? I mean, are we at the beginning of those years? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, at, we're, at the we're, at the, we're at the beginning. I mean, we were just on the planning part of it. The, the You know, it's, those are city-owned properties, and uh, they have to be developed. And um, But we are actually in the process of uh, um, doing our goal process, and um, those are our three target areas. And we would love to have grants in order to um, – Move these projects forward, but we're looking at other options too because we are ready to pull the trigger and start a plan of action to move this city forward on those projects. And, and, and Mayor, if I can jump into on the goals and projects that the mayor was talking about, um, the city council is just looking at approving those right now. Um, so hopefully we can make those more public. Um, and that's obviously part of, part of the process. But part of that project list is to identify, obviously, the, veneer, the riverfront property, the industrial property. And we really try to staff to lay out what the projects are in line as far as what's first, what's second, what's third, um, as well as labeling those of when we think we're anticipating to be done with those, as well as what the funding mechanisms are. Usually that's the main main 
hiccup in some of these projects is just the funding mechanisms, um, whether how we pay for a master plan that to be done. Um, so I think we've done a really good job as staff to lay out what those projects are in a timeline uh, yeah. that we'll be able to push out to the public so that they're aware. And that way it's kind of a check-in for the community as well as the council and staff um, so that we're keeping you abreast of what projects are coming up and when we anticipate to move on to the next phase. Great. I think we'll, yeah, to see there'll be a lot more information on this in three three months or so from now, just on where the direction that we're we're going, maybe a couple different roadmaps. Uh, you know, if, if we don't get grants, it's going to be uh, chunking it together and piece it to go, go as, it, you know, build as you uh, keep adding little blocks to the, the developments as far as what the city could do on our limited funds. We get a dollar ninety point eight per thousand. We are the lowest other than Columbia City in Columbia County. Rainier gets five ninety per thousand. The city operates on a dollar ninety. They get five ninety. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, we just have to be pretty creative in St. Helens. But are these numbers, um, Matt? Are these numbers on this list? Are they specific, or is it just um, approximate allocations, just like on the other five? They are approximate allocations. Yep, they are. Some best. of this rolls to the next year. Correct. Yes, we we may only spend sixty thousand dollars in professional services. Um, you may see that we, you know, this time next year we may have spent one hundred and twenty thousand in professional services because we just really got on it and got started. Um, and then if that ever comes up when we overspend those fund funding allocations appropriations, then that's when we move money from contingency up to that line item. So you'll see we have $192,000 in contingency specifically in this fund um, that we can just easily move up through a budget reappropriation. And the other option is if we do need more money from an influx, what we've done in the past is done an inner fund loan uh, from either the general fund or one of our enterprise funds. Um, a couple years ago, we did that for this, uh, com this community development fund from water and sewer, where we transferred $150,000 as a five-year loan to the, to the community development fund to kind of get that funding started so that we could start moving forward on projects. We have a problem in words, by the way. When we say planning, we could be planning what we think we want. We say planning, we're talking about where we're going to put concrete blocks and where we're going to put roads. So the fact that we'll be planning almost forever. Uh, when people say, well, you, why don't you get done? You've been planning. Well, actually, we've been planning different things. I think describing what type of plans and what stage the plans are in any project, a lot of people don't understand that. So visioning is one type of plans. Actual construction is another type of plans. And because in the middle of that, we've got grants and surveys and all other types of things that are called planning. Uh, again, it's the happiness people use words with that the community can understand. Because the riverfront, obviously, when we say planning, there's like, what, four or five steps of different types that would be going to be called planning. So, uh, so you're, you're talking about the four, are you talking about the four or five, you're talking about the five parcels? No, no. We're going to plan on what the building, we would like it to look like. We're going to plan what the uh, road well, I think, would be. Uh, well, I just think that you, you always bring this up, Steve, and I think there's, uh, and, uh, we're getting sidetracked, but there's been plenty of discussion that people want some retail, they want people. No, no, no I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that type of planning. I'm talking about the stages in planning, whether you're putting in grease monkeys, first you kind of describe that we need a grease monkey. And then so well, it's water, sewer, power, and that's maybe right. gas. That's right. All these things okay. are planning, but the Don't talk grease thing. monkey. I'm not here to play, do a show. Yeah, but, but that, when people here are planning, if they're not directly connected, they think you're doing the same thing that you were doing last year, and yet you're two steps further. And I think when the project list comes out, that will make it more clear. That's right. That, that was that's that's the goal of the project list is to identify what specific projects and what in what order they need to go in, um, right. so that staff is familiar, council is familiar, and especially the community understands what the process is and where we are. 
and each step has its own planning. Yeah. Correct. Each, each step is its own little project and has its own little loopholes and all the fun gummy stuff. Yeah, but it's, it's under that heading planning, and yet Correct. it's different than what it was before. And a lot of people don't understand that. That's what I'm trying to make yep. clear. Yep. And I, I, I think through either John, Rachel, myself, and as we kind of roll that out to the public and, and you as a council, um, hopefully that will become a little more clear to everyone. Yeah, I was going to add that the, uh, the council goals that are just adopted last night were at a level of detail that we haven't seen before as far as objectives and tasks. And you can take a look at each project and look at, at least some of the detail that we hope to accomplish over the coming year. Okay, any other questions from Community Development Fund? We only have two more slides. Perfect. Look how dark it is. What? I know, I can barely see your face. Now watch. See, now you can see me. It's like the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> All right. Uh, Community Enhancement Fund is the next uh, special revenue fund that we're going to look at. It's on pages 43 through 45. Um, this is mainly used as kind of a hodgepodge for miscellaneous revenues and expenses um, that we need to kind of keep track of separately. So um, this was used in the past um, mainly for a police grant that was received. Uh, that police grant is finalizing out. Um, so that will go away after, uh, after well, it's done now. There's still some final paperwork that needs to be done on my, uh, from my behalf um, and the uh, Department of Justice to finalize that grant out. The other main um, sections for this fund is the library and the Arts and Cultural Commission. And uh, Margaret, I'm not sure. I'm going to unmute you to see if there's anything that you wanted to discuss about the library uh, department within this fund. Um, it's the, there's a recurring grant that we get from the uh, state for our um, primarily summer reading program. It's called the Ready to Read grant. And we, we choose to use it for summer reading. It can also be used for other uses, but that's what we choose. So um, that's one of the grants that we see year after year. Um, sometimes we get um, other grants. Uh, uh, and this just is a place where we can track those funds so that when we have to do grant reporting, we've isolated those revenues and expenses to this particular account. Um, also, we have um, situations where we c collect money for uh, donations that come in. Um, the Friends of the Library will often uh, donate money for a specific purpose, and then that's how we uh, track those revenues and expenses. So when Matt said hodgepodge, that's probably a pretty good description. <laughs> that's what it looked like when I came here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, the transitional housing is a pass-through grant that we receive and send off. Um, and then Youth Council has a little bit of money that they do for selling reflectors or t-shirts or anything like that. Um, any other questions for the Community Enhancement Fund? All right, we're going to go on to the last slide here, which is the Street Funds, which is uh, back to uh, Sue. If uh, you want to speak at all about uh, this next year's street fund? Um, uh, <laughs> so most of the most of the revenue comes from the motor vehicle tax. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's state yeah, grants. exactly. Um, state grants is also referred to by Sue and myself as STP funds. Um, so you might see that um, in the document. Oh. Yeah, um, that's, that's, a, that's a separate funding source. Yeah. State transportation, STP. Uh, do you have do you have a um, any projection because the gas tax isn't that this money? That is this money, and actually the that's the, big hit. that's the one that they're like predicting that that's a, one of the revenue sources that could sub be substantially less. Yeah, it, particularly for Portland, though, because they put a, an extra ten on their their gas. <laughs> well, but the thing is, we have so many people that commute here. You know, I don't know how they split it out, but this is the out of all the funds, this is the one that, other than hotel motel, this is where the hit is. 
Yeah, and, and the revenue line that you see for the motor vehicle tax there, um, that estimate comes from the League of Oregon Cities. Yeah. So that is what I use for the estimates. That's what almost every other city uses. Um, we get those revenue sharing uh, pamphlets, um, you know, January, February timeframe. Um, and that's what we use to calculate motor vehicle tax is just one of those uh, revenue sharing mechanisms. Obviously, it'd be a lot different it'll be a lot different than it was in January. Yes. Yep. And that, you know, whether what the shortfall is for the remaining of the, this year. Yep. And I think part of that, um, you know, if once we, you know, if and when we see a decrease in that revenue, uh, that's when likely Sue and John and uh, myself may bring some discussions to the council about capital outlay projects that we may or may not do. Um, you know, one particular project we've talked internally about is the, the intersection um, on, on First Street um, that, you know, we're currently doing a plan for. Um, however, that funding for that, that whole intersection and the gateway project, you know, is roughly about $500,000. Um, and so, you know, is this the right time to spend that money? Um, or is it more apropos to wait for it, see if we can find any grant funds that may come out of this coronavirus um, project that we can get federally or locally uh, from the state to, to put towards those projects. So those are some of the discussions that we'll likely have with city council later on in the year um, once we start to see what the revenue portion of this street fund does. One thing is, is we'll get a lot more alcohol and marijuana tax money from the state level. I can guarantee you Yes, that. that, well, and fortunately or unfortunately, um, you know, it's a good thing that we're not a sales tax state. Um, is there for that reason, tax? and yes, we do usually see during the recession's time, there is an uptick in cigarettes uh, and OLCC and cannabis tax. Um, so those those general sharing revenue sources from the state, um, we usually do see an uptick during the recession. Matt, when are these numbers reported to us what it's going to be? Every month, every six months, or at the, at the end of a year? I would say probably the state's going to probably do a quarterly report, um, or at least an update. Um, I haven't seen anything, and I'm not sure if Sue has at all. Nope. Um, it's kind of a little bit too early to, you know, really, right now everybody's really just sticking their finger in the air and seeing, you know, how hard the wind's blowing in what direction. Um, and nobody really has a clear answer uh, for us. So I don't think the state is going to put out any real numbers until... So uh, that would be the index uh, finger, man. Yeah, the index finger, correct. Typically, we Typically, we don't get a monthly report then of how this is going along on the, the highway tax. Yeah. Usually, I, you know, honestly, I usually just see the League of Oregon Cities report budget for the next year, and then we just get revenue kind of shows up as it shows up. Okay. Uh, so okay. My, my only guess would be, or my only assumption would be in the future as these next few months roll on into the new year, we can compare what we've received in July, August, September, to what we did last year. And we can see where those decreases are. And we can do that for any month um, in, the, in the near future to, to try and track on our own what those decreases are. Um, but where those decreases are in the future uh, is really a, a kind of a best guess idea. Yeah, I was hoping we have a schedule when those numbers would arrive. No, the state does oh. not give us any kind of uh, firm data idea of when those numbers are gonna, or better estimates will be released. Okay, that's what that scares me. I can understand that. <laughs> right, but the 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 biggest numbers are going to be beginning fund balance. It's going to be what we start. Those are going to be the biggest numbers, the uh, the March, April, May numbers, and that'll yeah. be beginning beginning fund balance. Team. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what we receive or don't receive in April, May, and June um, will affect the, whatever the beginning balance may be in July. So that is the um, end of tonight's presentation. Uh, Sue, oh, Sue, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I just want, I did want to make one comment on, on the street budget. Um, if you look at the line by line uh, itemization on page 46, it appears that there's a large increase in our requested operating supply budget from last year's, which was $45,000. It looks like it's a, um, increased to $70,000. 
what happened there was we shifted some um, what used to be uh, identified in the capital projects. We uh, shifted those funds into the operating budget based on the recommendations from the auditors. Um, and the two particular items were the street sweeping cleanup, which we have to haul the, the material that is swept up off the streets by the street sweeper. Um, that we store that and that actually has to be hauled off to a uh, hazardous waste dump site. And so we had allocated about $30,000 to, to do that. We weren't able to do it last year because the, the closest facility was Hillsboro and it was, they had closed off that cell and we weren't able to take any dump, any of the um, sweepings out there and dump them last year. So uh, we do anticipate being able to do it this year. Uh, we think we found a, a less expensive place in Longview where they've opened up a new cell over there where we can take it for about half the cost um, anyway, that funding was shifted over into the operating supplies and the other item that was shifted over there was we are required by the state to be replacing all of the street signs, all of the little, the little um, oh, yeah. blades up there that say, you know, Columbia Boulevard and South 2nd Street and whatever. Um, those have to be replaced and we submitted a plan to them that they accepted. So that's about $7,000 a year for the next 10 years to replace all of those signs. That's all. Awesome. Any other last minute questions before we, uh, um, Garrett officially kind of, I can give it back to Garrett then? Can I ask a question before, cause she brought up something I didn't know we were happen having. Um, could you, um, about the little street sign replacement. I assume that's because they're faded out and some of them you can't read. That's part of it, but they've also changed the standard of how large the letters have to be and that they used to be, a lot of them you see are all capital letters. Right. And um, now they've changed it to, it's a capital and small letters. Yeah. And they have to be a different height. Hey, These Sue, different let's, let's have a uh, public auction once we get, store all the signs, let's have a yeah. public auction after we're done, the old signs. They do keep them. Yes. Yeah. Let, let's do a... Yeah, people... Well, they, yes. I just thought it'd be cool to let the community know because, yeah. like, if your neighborhood's getting done, it might be exciting to know what's happening and stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, the update. I'm betting that the Elm Street, which we do have an Elm Street, will be one of the bigger uh, bid items. <laughs> yeah, but that's a cool project, Sue. Thanks for um, pulling that out. Yeah. Whoever mentioned selling us, uh, selling the signs is, is, is hey, that's genius. And the, one of the things that happened up at Timberline is they're replacing the chairlift, uh, Pucci chairlift, and what uh, friends of Timberline came up with says, hey, for a fundraiser, why can't we sell the, the uh, chairlifts? Let's Ooh. put the chairlifts up for sale for $500. They were gone <laughs> in eight hours once, <laughs> they hit the, once they hit. So, I, I mean, it's amazing. And there were 80, uh, I think 84 chairlifts. So 84 times 500 uh, helps a long way. And it was just somebody's idea. So these ideas are really really kind of cool that with we could do a fundraiser for selling those signs sure yeah any other uh questions before i hand it back to garrett I was gonna say you got me out in the dark and look at me <laughs> uh, just look at me a little scary you're ready for halloween town <laughs> all right uh garrett i'll go ahead and hand it back to you to close the meeting for the night okay uh, since we completed the agenda, uh, the meeting is adjourned. All right, y'all have a good night. Thank you. Good very night, much. everyone. Thanks. See you next week. Next next meeting is well, next week. Next week, next Thursday, same time, seven o'clock. And I will send out a reminder email with the link and meeting ID information to everyone. Sounds good. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thanks.